Against the background of increasing universal terror, four existential challenges are on the horizon that threaten our future. The curtain is coming down. We, the people of the world, are confronted with a collapse in civilization that is greater than anything that we have faced since civilization began. The next ice age is before us. Never before were we confronted with the near return of the Ice Age, for which the transition has already begun, and which, because of society's severe denial of it, has put the world at the threshold of the severest food crisis, resulting in consequences that already echo those of the Little Ice Age that have caused immense cultural losses with the resulting ramping down in food production. Number two, the financial and economic system is collapsing worldwide. Never before has civilization on this planet been overshadowed with a complete worldwide financial and economic collapse that threatens to tear down the physical support structures that are necessary for human living. Number three, war has become so devastating that it now threatens all life. The technology of war has become so powerfully destructive that it not only threatens the extinction of humanity but also, potentially, all life on this planet. Number four. The end game of empire has begun as a quest for depopulation. Society finds itself unaware of its danger and the game that is being played against it. With the system of empire now in the final stages of disintegrating, having looted the world that it is preying on to the breaking point. The collapse of the system of empire can no longer be avoided, so that the master's endgame has begun for tearing the entire world down with the often stated intention for the mass depopulation of the planet the remnant of which the masters aim to rule over in the aftertimes, in perpetuity. The global warming doctrine is intertwined with all four aspects. One, its terror has disabled science and truth to the point that the Ice Age challenge remains hidden. Two, its terror against human living has effectively disabled scientific progress and economic development. Three, its terrible inhumanity now threatens war on an infinite scale. Four, its terror syndrome has set the stage for an endgame quest that may end all life. Countering the terror and its consequences means banning the system of empire from the citadel of civilization. The solution is twofold. One, economic development without an empire culture. Two, spiritual development of a humanist culture that, that disables war and enable scientific, technological, and economic development. This dual aspect is the focus of the first presentation of exploring aspects of terror that the global warming terror is a part of.
The end of empire has come, as it must, because there is no wealth created by stealing. The wealth of the stolen loot is an illusion. The giant bailout giveaway since 2008, primarily by the USA, to keep the dead corpse of monetarism alive, hasn't revived anything, but has hastened the collapse of whatever real wealth remained, thus hastening the final end. And so the end game is on, as everything real is collapsing. This system cannot be revived, but it can be replaced. When society gives itself the needed credit to produce the infrastructures and industries that provide the wealth of its living, the predatory monetarist process ends, and with it the structure of oligarchy and empire ends. Whenever the credit principle was applied in U.S. history, the nation prospered and the world prospered with it wherever this principle was applied. It had brought great prosperity to the USA and had uplifted the economic landscape of Europe. But it was crushed again with the terror campaigns. One assassinated President McKinley in 1901. Another forced the ouster of Bismarck in Germany and set the stage for World War I that caused such a terrible tangled economic mess in Europe that the credit principle could not be applied again. When there was a tendency to get back to it during the Winmar Republic, Hitler was financed into power, which put an end to that hope. The credit society principle is key to economic development anywhere in the world. The global warming doctrine prohibits the very notion of economic development with its terror campaign against energy use. Since there is no truth in the doctrine, its evident purpose is to prevent society from getting back to its credit principle that ends oligarchy and empire. We stand at a critical junction today. Empire has destroyed its own foundation, which is the inevitable outcome of its looting system, and its destroyed society with it. While empire cannot be rescued, society can still rescue itself by gaining its freedom from empire, which means shutting down monetarism and getting back to the proven historic credit principle that ends oligarchy and empire together. But the oligarchy that understands well that its world is collapsing like a hysterical child that would rather smash its toy to pieces than give it up, aims to tear down the whole world rather than letting its dominance over it be taken away. War has always served the purpose of preventing society from getting back onto its feet and gaining its freedom. In today's age, the response of empire would mean tearing the world down with it as it falls, and this so low that empire might rule once again over what remains of the world. That's the mindset. Thus the end game means war. A world war to destroy Russia, China, India, and what is left of the USA. Of course, now that the end game has begun, war means nuclear war. Nuclear war was originally designed merely as a terror weapon, a weapon so terrible that all of the nations of the world would give up their sovereignty at the feet of a world-controlling empire. That's what the script writers of empire had argued in their novels long before the bomb became a reality. With the envisioned terror bomb becoming reality, World War II had been precariously extended to enable the demonstration of it as a grand terror weapon. Hiroshima and Nagasaki were the collateral sacrifices in that demonstration scheme. Two cities were erased for the purpose of terror. 
Then the war was allowed to end. In the post-war era, the terror scheme faltered when Russia developed the bomb too, and a bigger one, the hydrogen bomb. When Russia had spoiled the plot, rather than allowing itself to be collateral on the road to more terror, the terror focus of empire was shifted to the Cold War scheme of balanced terror under the doctrine of mutually assured destruction. During the Cold War years, nuclear war was never meant to be unleashed. The nuclear weapons buildup served the purpose of terror. Now that the end game of empire has begun, a new environment unfolds before us that brings back the meaning of what an end game implies. Nuclear war, that had never been intended to happen and didn't happen, is now intended to happen and may be upon us in the near future. The evident game of empire would have the USA to destroy Russia, China, and India, the historic enemies of empire, and thus to sacrifice itself in the process which a nuclear war would efficiently accomplish. All this is already set up. The required hardware exists in great abundance, carefully maintained since the days of the Cold War, and prepositioned in many cases. Israel, an obedient asset of empire, is required to play the sacrificial role to get the process started with a unilateral attack on Iran. That's already in the works. After his visit to London at the beginning of November in 2010, the Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu was quoted in a big Israeli newspaper as saying that the decision had been made to go for a preemptive strike on Iran. In conjunction with this, Israel's newest nuclear ICBM, the Jericho 3, that had gone into service in 2008, was tested possibly as a hint that the war would be nuclear. Israelis' aircraft don't have the range to reach Iran and return home without American refueling along the way. The U.S. Navy appears to be coordinated with this plan. The U.S. Navy has started a massive buildup in roughly the same time frame in which the leaders of Israel have made the decision that they will attack Iran. The U.S. Navy has placed three aircraft carrier groups into the game, one in the Mediterranean and two in the Indian Ocean. In addition, a law has been passed in Congress in the same time frame that by its design is evidently intended to lay the groundwork for quick escalation to war. The Iran Threat Reduction Act of 2011 as it was passed in Congress in November 2011, would make it illegal for any U.S. official to speak to an Iranian official unless the president issues a special waiver that lifts the ban and submits it to Congress 15 days before the waiver becomes effective. While the war invitation law may not pass the Senate, the intention of the law is obvious. The prohibiting of diplomatic communication with Iran while a massive military buildup is staged near its shores and in areas nearby rings like a declaration of intention to go to war in the shortest possible time. In essence, the massive military buildup and escalating war cries all add up to a hidden declaration of war that is not so much against Iran itself, that would serve merely as the sacrificial collateral, but against the whole of humanity, that is the real intended target in the shadow of the historic targets of empire, which are Russia, India, and China. Attacking Iran, and also North Korea, would facilitate the destruction of Russia, India, and China, and the whole world would be devastated in the process, as has been announced repeatedly, is an intention of the empire 
under the depopulation doctrine that has already decimated Africa. In the fourth generation of atomic warfare, the goals of empire are easily achieved. It is no longer necessary now to attack a targeted country directly. In the age of the depleted uranium wars, the DU wars, it has become sufficient to choose a nearby bombing ground for the mass use of uranium bombs and munitions that vaporize on impact and inject an active killer into the airstream. Iran and North Korea have evidently been chosen for this collateral role. The only strategic value of both Iran and North Korea, which are both high on the target list in the war's plans of empire, is their location and their rocky terrain. DU weapons require a hard impact to vaporize efficiently. With Iran and North Korea having evidently been chosen as the new bombing grounds, nearly all of Eurasia can be covered with the most deadly warfare pollutant yet devised. Uranium is a deadly poison in whatever form it is used in weapons, depleted or not. When it becomes vaporized into gaseous particles, smaller than the wavelengths of light, which the weapon's impact facilitates, it becomes a part of the air that people inhale. However, no matter how small the particles may be, they retain the radioactive qualities of uranium as a powerful alpha radiation emitter. Alpha radiation is not a ray or a wave, but a heavy nucleonic bullet. The bullet doesn't travel far, as it impacts with everything in its way. A piece of paper can stop alpha radiation, or a person's clothing or skin. But when the uranium is inhaled, the nucleonic cannons become intimately lodged into the most sensitive regions of the human biology, where they inflict immense damage. The biological system operates with low energies in the range of 10 electron volts. With alpha radiation, mass is ejected with a kinetic energy in the range of 3 to 7 million electron volts. Its damaging effect is correspondingly extensive. In close contact with the biological system, Alpha radiation is the most destructive form of ionizing radiation there is. The human body has no defenses against it. The Russian dissident Alexander V. Litvinenko was assassinated in 2006 with a few milligrams of plutonium-210, a highly powerful alpha emitter that was put in his drink. In this case, the radiation source wasn't inhaled but ingested, which is also a path in which the DU poison becomes effective. In its airborne form, the DU weapons particle is typically 40 times smaller than a red blood cell. Gasified uranium dust is a powerful poison. The air stream gives it wide circulation as the Iraq and Afghanistan wars have illustrated. The Iraq and Afghanistan wars have provided a small-scale demonstration of the devastating consequences of this new type of warfare. The DU war has caused huge increases in birth defects too horrible to show and massive increases in cancers up to sixfold in the distant USA. An increase in worldwide diabetes from 30 to 230 million cases worldwide, and a vast range of other diseases, none of which are treatable, including the Gulf War syndromes that rendered a half a million veterans disabled. Once the process of poisoning the air gets going, Russia, India, and China will have to stop it. 
and they will have to stop it fast by all means possible to save themselves. This means resorting to thermonuclear war against the USA to shut down the delivery system. The radiation from uranium doesn't diminish for billions of years. The poisoning cannot be allowed to build up in the air. It kills indiscriminately not just human beings, but also animals, birds, insects, including bees. The future of life, if not all life on this planet, depends on our success in ending the culture of empire that has become such a destructive force, expressed in war, that it now actively threatens every living thing on earth. The process of ending the culture of empire and securing life and our future with it, while it has many political elements incorporated, is ultimately a spiritual process that unfolds with the restoration and the further development of truth, love, and humanity in society, which are the keystones of the house of civilization. All nature whispers this to us. Economic development is the inevitable outcome of cultural healing that renders empire as a thing of the past, like a fatal disease that has been overcome and enables a world of plenty produced by humanity for one another. With the culture of humanity, truth and love re-established and advancing further in which the beauty in human living is drawn ever more to the foreground, creating a renaissance in which the critical Ice Age challenge that now stands before us can be easily met. Yes, we have come to the crossroads today. One path leads to freedom and joy. The wrong path leads in a direction from which no one comes back, towards a land of silence without a human voice. The current uh, inclination is in this direction, towards an extinction event. We inhabit this planet and determine our future, one way or another, by default and indifference, or by being certain where our future lies. The choice shouldn't be difficult. Our future lies where the human heart and the human spirit already are, where our hope is located and where our divine humanity bears out its infinite promise, where life unfolds joyfully, creatively and beautifully.